Hi guys, welcome to my Edexcel GCSE 9 to 1 all in one chemistry video. Hope you find it super helpful. I'm not sure how long it's going to be, but I have gone through it and tried to make sure I've hit every single specification point. All my perfect answers flash up. And don't forget, if you want to buy my revision guide, which I have written containing my perfect answers, you can get that on the website, um, which will flash up now. Um, I hope you find this video super, super helpful. I hope your studies are going well. Don't forget to come follow me on Insta, Twitter and Facebook because I add lots of extra exam tips, extra explanations and just general cool science stuff, particularly on Insta. So I really would recommend giving that a go and I do go through past papers there too. So yeah, hope you find this video helpful. Let's get started. Unfortunately, there are some ions which you'll simply have to learn off by heart because you can't work them out from the periodic table. So let's just go through what all of these are. Starting with these transition metals along here, just gonna have to learn them. The first one is silver, this one is copper, Pb2 plus is lead, and zinc is Zn2 plus. Notice with transition metals like iron that have variable valencies, you'll be given it in the question so you can actually see what their charge will be given by the Roman numerals. So that's not something you need to remember. This is the ammonium ion. And now looking at the negative ions, if it's combined with oxygen, it tends to have eight in its name. So this is carbonate, sulfate, and nitrate. And that final ion is hydroxide. So now we can get started on some examples. So starting with magnesium chloride, so let's write down the ions. We can see from the periodic table that magnesium is in group two, hence Mg2+. Chlorine is in group seven, so eight minus seven is one, hence Cl minus. Now have a look, they're not balanced, obviously. You've got a two plus and a one minus charge, so clearly you need two chlorines. Remember when you're writing the formula, you write a small number after the element in question, which is why this is the formula of magnesium chloride. So lead hydroxide, these are both ions you're going to have to learn off by heart. So Pb2 plus, OH minus, so we've got the same issue here in that we don't have enough minus, so you need two OHs, so you're going to write PbOH2, however the two applies to both the oxygen and the hydrogen, which is why you need brackets, so insert brackets and that is your formula. Now lithium, lithium is in group one, so it has an Li1 plus charge. So it has a one plus charge. Oxygen is group, in group six, eight minus six is two, so it's O2 minus. This means you need two lithium for every oxygen, so Li2O. Magnesium nitrate, magnesium is in group two, so Mg2 plus. Nitrate, you've got to learn from the list above, NO3 minus. You've got a one minus charge with nitrate compared with the two plus charge on the magnesium, which explains why you need two lots of that magnes of that nitrate, and you need to insert brackets again. Don't touch this three here, that just remains part of the formula. People get confused and start moving it around. No, that is the final answer. Lastly, aluminium in group three, three plus. Learn sulfate's charge, which is SO4 two minus. This is a difficult one now, it's not that clear. You've got to find a common number that both three and two go into, which is six. So if I show you my thought process, I effectively need two aluminiums and three sulfates to make it equal six, because now we have six plus on the aluminium side, six minus on the sulfate side. So that's therefore Al2SO43, not forgetting the brackets as usual. Now, if you don't like the method I just showed you, there is a cheats way of doing it where you don't actually have to understand the chemistry. What you do is you write out the ions as usual. So potassium is in group one, hence one plus. Oxygen is in group six, eight minus six is two, so two minus. And all you have to do here is swap and drop. So literally bring down that invisible one to here, that two to there, and then rewrite the ions. So your final answer is K2O and it works with anything really. So let's do aluminium nitrate. Aluminium's in group three. Nitrate we've learned off by heart from the list above. We're gonna swap and drop. So we're gonna bring that three down. We're gonna bring that invisible one down. 
and so it becomes Al NO3 3 because you brought that 3 down. We start by looking back in history and look at the original structure of the atom so we can actually understand all our findings that we know to be true today. So originally there was the Thomson plum pudding model. Now you don't need to know too much about this, but just know that a plum pudding, this was in the 1800s by the way, so you can imagine a Christmas pudding if you don't know what a plum pudding is. I don't know what one is. So a big sphere of sponge embedded with different types of fruit and in the case of the plum pudding, those were plums. And Thompson stated that the sponge was made out of positive charge and that those plums embedded within that sphere of sponge were the electrons. Now we know that this is false because we now know the modern day structure of the atom with its nucleus and its shells with the electrons circling. And we're going to talk about the gold foil experiment to help us understand why this new atom became the accepted model. So Rutherford fired alpha particles, and we'll talk about alpha particles soon, at gold foil. Now he found that most of them passed straight through and this was strange because really if the atom was structured like a plum pudding there's no way these alpha particles should have passed straight through but because they passed straight through it told him that the atom is largely empty space which we know to be true. Some alpha particles were deflected and because an alpha particle is positive it told him that they had hit something also positive and that they had been repelled and that made him understand that the nucleus was positively charged which we know to be true because that's where the protons are found. Lastly, very few of the alpha particles were deflected in this way and this told him that the nucleus was very small. So do link together what he did with what findings he found out and the conclusions he drew from those findings and that will help you score really highly. So we now have our structure of the atom. We know that it has a nucleus containing protons and neutrons. Remember this is also known as the nucleon number and that's just the name given to all the particles found within the nucleus. And surrounding the nucleus are the shells of electrons where the electrons orbit. So just to remind ourselves that the mass of a neutron and a proton is one. A mass of an electron is very small, so one divided by 2000 or 1800, depends what your teachers taught you and that the neutrons, because they're neutral, have no charge, protons have a positive one charge, and electrons have a negative one charge. So when we look at an atom, we know that it is uncharged, which therefore means it must have equal numbers of electrons and protons. Now looking at the periodic table, just remember that the atomic number is the number of protons, and the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And this will become really important when we now come to look at isotopes, so things like carbon-12, carbon-14. Remember that these are atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So remember you need to know about lots of different scientists and how they originally arranged the periodic table. Now Dalton arranged the elements in order of atomic mass. Mendeleev came along at a later date and he's really the father of the modern periodic table as we know it but do notice that he also arranged the elements in order of atomic mass. So Mendeleev was also responsible for this and we know this to be incorrect because the modern periodic table is arranged in order of atomic number. And if you actually have a look at the periodic table, make sure you double check the key, but you will see that it is correct, that it is arranged in terms of atomic number as opposed to atomic mass. But why do we think Mendeleev was really the father of the periodic table? Well, that's because he left spaces for undiscovered elements. Whereas other scientists had assumed that all elements had been discovered, so they were simply trying to arrange those elements within a periodic table, he was like, hang on, I don't think technology has advanced enough to actually mean that we found all the elements that do actually exist. So I'm going to predict both their properties and I'm going to leave space for them. When we look at the periodic table, you must be really familiar with how to use the periodic table and what it's telling you. So make sure you use the key because that will tell you which is the mass number and which is the atomic number. But generally speaking, the top number tends to be the mass number. 
and the bottom number tends to be the atomic number. So the atomic number is actually the number of protons found in an atom. So for carbon, that would be six. And I told you already that atoms are neutral, which means their proton number equals their electron number, which means the electron number of carbon will also be six. And if we draw the electronic configuration diagram, we know that two electrons go into the first shell and the remaining four go into the second shell. Now looking at the mass number. Now the mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons. So if carbon has an atomic number of six, that means the proton number is six, it has a mass number of 12, that means you can work out the neutron number by taking the atomic number away from the mass number, so the neutron number of carbon is six. Small thing to notice is the nucleon number, and that's just the total number of particles found within the nucleus of an atom, so it's the total of the protons and neutrons i.e. it's also the mass number, so they're very closely linked. Isotopes now, so if you look in the periodic table you will see that some mass numbers aren't whole numbers, such as chlorine which is 35.5 and that's because chlorine exists as an isotope, which means that there, some chlorine atoms have a high mass number of 37 and other ones have a mass number of 35 and when you work out an average you actually find that it's 35.5 and that's because there are far more chlorine 35s compared with chlorine 37s. However, you just need to know the definition of an isotope which is that it is atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. You may be asked to calculate the relative abundance of various isotopes and now I will show you how to do that on the iPad. Now we need to touch on calculating the relative atomic abundance of these various isotopes and this is how you need to do it. So the question will look something like this. The abundance of chlorine 35 is 75% and the abundance of chlorine 37 is 25%. Calculate the relative atomic mass of chlorine. So 35 is one isotope's mass and 37 is the second isotope's mass. So all you have to do is take each isotope's mass, so 35, times it by its percentage, which is 75, and add it to the second isotope's mass, times it by its percentage, and then divide the whole thing by 100. And when you do that, you get the answer of 35.5 to three significant figures. And that's how you need to do it. Doesn't matter what the element is, you times its mass by its percentage, add it to the other mass, times it by its percentage, and divide by 100. Relative atomic mass, I've already described a little bit, but you do need to be able to define it. And that is that it's the ratio of the average mass of an element when compared with one atom of carbon-12. Going back to the periodic table then, looking at group numbers and period numbers. So the group numbers are the numbers that run along the top of the periodic table. The group number corresponds to the number of electrons in the outer shell. So group one elements will all have one electron in the outer shell. Now the period numbers run down the side and they refer to the rows. And the period number will correspond to the number of shells of electrons. Why do elements in the same group tend to have the same chemical properties? That's due to the number of electrons in the outer shell. So the answer here is because they have the same number of electrons in the outer shell. So why do fluorine and chlorine behave similarly? Because they're both in group 7 and therefore they both have 7 electrons in their outer shell. Let's look at group 0 now. What is their name otherwise known as? It is the noble gases. And why are they so unreactive? And that's because they have full outer shells, which means they don't really want to get involved in bonding. As a quick overview of the periodic table, do notice there's a step line on the right hand side and therefore the metals occur on the left hand side of that step line and the non-metals appear on the right hand side with hydrogen appearing by itself at the top because it behaves very differently from all other elements. Let's look at ionic bonding now. So it's ionic which means it has to be a metal and a non-metal. Use your periodic table to double check that the two things you've been given are metals and non-metals. If they're not, they're probably they're asking about covalent bonding. So, let's have a look at magnesium oxide, for example. Now, magnesium has an atomic number of 12, and oxygen has an atomic number of 8. So, let's work out their electronic configurations. So, two electrons go into the first shell, then they fill up to 8, so that's why magnesium is 282 and oxygen is 
We only need to draw the outer electrons here, so don't worry about drawing the whole atom. So there's magnesium's two electrons on the outer shell. Here's oxygen's. Make sure you use crosses and dots to distinguish between the two atoms. There's six, so we can clearly see where those two electrons will be deposited. And now we can actually draw the answer. So because magnesium's lost its two electrons, I'm not going to show any electrons here. Electrons have a minus charge, which is why its net charge will now be 2 plus, because it's lost two electrons. Now oxygen will have gained two electrons. I'll try and draw them a bit more circular than that. That is shocking. And I'm going to use two dots to represent the electrons that came from magnesium. Because it's gained two electrons, that's why the charge is now 2 minus. And therefore, we can see the formula of magnesium oxide is MgO. Let's look at a different example now, which is magnesium chloride. So magnesium still has an atomic number of 12. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. So drawing out their electronic configurations again. You can see, to be honest, the outer shell electrons from the group number. So it's up to you which way you do it. So magnesium again, two electrons. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. So we can see where that first electron is going to go, but there's still a second electron here that needs to go somewhere, which is why we need a second chlorine atom. In terms of your final answer, draw magnesium. It has lost two electrons, which is why it's two plus. Chlorine has gained an electron from magnesium, which is why it is 1 minus. There are two chlorine atoms, so that's why I draw a second one, keeping it identical the first one to the first one that I've already drawn. And that's your final answer. Looking now at aluminium oxide, which is the most difficult example. So aluminium has an atomic number of 13, so its electronic configuration is 283. Oxygen has an atomic number of 8, so it's 2.6. So aluminium's outer shell will have 3 electrons on it. Oxygen will have 6 electrons. So we can see where the first two electrons will be deposited, which is here. But unfortunately, we've still got a leftover aluminium electron, so we need a second oxygen atom, which I'm going to draw here. You don't need these intermediate steps, by the way, if you can go straight to the answer. I'm just showing you how I found my answer out. So that's where that aluminium electron is going to go. But that leaves oxygen still missing an electron, because now it only has seven electrons in its outer shell. So we need a second aluminium atom, still with three electrons in its outer shell. So there's one of those electrons. But unfortunately, we've still got two electrons to give away, which is why we need a third oxygen atom. And finally, it's happy, because you can see where those two electrons would go. And now let's actually work out what our answer will look like. I hope I've got space for this. Probably won't have. So aluminium has lost three electrons, so that's why it's three plus. We need two of them, which is why I'm drawing them twice. And then oxygen will therefore look like this. There's three of them. Let's label them as oxygen. Let's show their outer electrons. So basically, they're clones of each other. They're all the same. And each oxygen gained two electrons, which is why their net charge is 2 minus. So actually, the formula of aluminium oxide, as we can see, is Al2O3. Looking at covalent bonding now, we can see we're looking at two non-metals. So don't be tempted to draw an ionic bonding diagram. We're going to take a nice straightforward example to begin with, which is water, H2O. So we're going to have a central oxygen atom, two hydrogen atoms coming up the side, label the atoms, and then have a look in the periodic table and see how many electrons they have in the outer shell. And remember, that's given by their group number. So hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. Oxygen has six, four, five, six, and now double check and see that they're both full. Oxygen now has eight electrons in its outer shell. 
Hydrogen only has two, but that's fine because remember the first shell only needs two to be become full. So that is now a perfectly completed covalent bonding diagram. Let's look at methane now, which is CH4, which you need to know for organic chemistry. So try and arrange this nice and symmetrically. That isn't particularly symmetrical, but it will do. So again, hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, so let's start by filling in those ones. Carbon is in group four, so it has four electrons. And actually that's already done because now hydrogen has two in its outer shell. Carbon has eight, so that is now correct. Carbon dioxide is trickier, and I'll show you that example now. So remember that's CO2. Remember with this one that it has double covalent bonds and that will really help you with your answer. So carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. But I'm drawing it like that because I know it's a double covalent bond. Oxygen has six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they both need to have eight electrons to be four. So carbon has eight electrons as two shared pairs and oxygen has eight. So that is correct. The most difficult example you could be given is ethene C2H4. So I'm going to show you how to do that. There's your central carbon atoms. Here's your four hydrogens. Label them. It's easiest to start with the hydrogens here, remembering they have one electron in the outer shells. Carbon has four, so let's make sure that hydrogen's happy first of all. So one, two, three, four. Let's do the other side. One, two, three, four. And now have a look. Yes, all the hydrogens have two electrons in the outer shell, and each carbon now has eight, so that is correct. Let's now take a look at the chemical structures part of the specification and when we're talking about chemical structures we're talking about four main structures that is giant covalent, giant ionic, giant metallic and simple molecular and you need to know and understand why they have various properties such as either high or low melting points, electrical conductivity, that sort of thing but we're going to start initially with giant ionic structures so remember these are made up of a metal and a non-metal and what is an ionic bond? Well, it's the electrostatic forces of attraction between oppositely charged ions. So remember that the metal ion is positive and the non-metal ion is negative and therefore they attract. So why do giant ionic structures have such high melting and boiling points? And that's because they have strong electrostatic forces of attraction between oppositely charged ions. And don't forget to qualify this by saying that they require a lot of energy to break. Why don't they conduct when solid? That's because the ions aren't free to move. Why do they conduct when they're molten or liquid? That's simply because the ions are free to move to carry the current. Why are they brittle? And don't forget that brittle means that they smash easily when hit. That's because when you hit them, or when a force is applied, the layers of ions slide so the ions with the same charge end up next to each other. So positive charges will therefore repel and the whole structure breaks apart. So that's giant ionic done, moving on to giant covalent, and we are really looking at carbon here, so we're looking at diamond and graphite, which remember are both forms of carbon. So the definition of an allotrope is different forms of the same element. So why does diamond have such a high melting point? And that's because it has a giant tetrahedral structure, which really means that each carbon atom is bonded to four others. So it has many strong covalent bonds, which require a lot of energy to break. Why does graphite have a high melting point? Similar argument, but this time each carbon atom is bonded to three. You still have many strong covalent bonds and it still requires a lot of energy to break, but because it's bonded to three rather than four carbon atoms, that's why graphite has a slightly lower melting point than diamond. Why is graphite used as a lubricant? That's because the carbon atoms are arranged in layers with weakened molecular forces between the layers 
These require little energy to break and therefore the layers can slide off each other, hence it's used as a lubricant. Why doesn't diamond conduct electricity? And that's because it has no free electrons. However, graphite does conduct electricity, the reason being that each carbon atom, as we've already said, is only bonded to three others, meaning that there's a fourth electron which is free to move and therefore carry the current. Now, there are lots of different forms of carbon. We've already met graphite, we've met diamond. Another version of it is the fullerenes, and these include various substances. So first of all, graphene. So we know it's a form of the element carbon. but it is actually only a single layer of graphite. So it's incredibly similar to graphite, but it's just a single layer. But because it is actually made out of graphite, it will have very similar properties. So that includes a very high melting point. It's gonna be very strong due to the presence of many strong covalent bonds, which we know requires a lot of force to break or lots of energy to break. And similarly to graphite, it conducts electricity. Why? Well, that's due to the presence of delocalized or free moving electrons. Another type of fullerene you need to be aware of is C60. And to give them a more typical name, we call these buckyballs. And they have a very distinctive shape. The C60 indicates the number of carbon atoms, so obviously 60 carbon atoms. And they're joined using covalent bonds, as you would expect. Notice that they are not giant covalent structures. So this is where C60 differs from graphite and diamond. And instead you find that there are weak intermolecular forces between individual buckyballs. As a consequence, little energy is required to break these forces. And in terms of the buckyball's properties, you find that they are slippery and they have lower melting points when compared with graphite or diamond. We should touch on a covalent bond here. Now remember a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. If you want to be more complex about it, you can say it's the electrostatic attraction between the positive nucleus and the shared pair of electrons. Why do simple molecular substances have such low melting points? And that's because they have weak intermolecular forces which do not require a lot of energy to break. A small point to note, which is why do simple molecular substances have increasing boiling point with increasing MR? So remember, MR is the relative atomic mass, so it's really saying something like, why does ethane, C2H6, have a higher melting point than methane, CH4? And that's because ethane, so substances with a greater MR, have greater intermolecular forces of attraction between molecules and these require a lot more energy to break. And remember when you're boiling these substances, you're not breaking apart the individual atoms from the molecule, you're simply separating one molecule from another. So you're breaking intermolecular forces. Now in terms of looking at various structures, at school you might have actually used various models such as molly mods, where you kind of stick balls and sticks together to show the structure of compounds. Obviously, we draw dot and cross diagrams. We use 2 and 3D representations. But what are the various limitations of these? So starting with the limitations of dot and cross diagrams, I've shown you a couple of examples here. So obviously, we've got sodium chloride, which is an ionic compound, hydrogen chloride, which is covalent. So first of all, the limitations include the fact that they don't show the structure of the molecule formed. And secondly, as you can see through the use of the dot and cross, it suggests that the electrons of the different atoms are different, but actually they are exactly the same.
Next up, we're looking at the limitations of 3D ball and stick models, so probably the ones you've made in school. And first of all, it's the fact that atoms are not that far apart in reality. And secondly, there obviously aren't sticks holding together atoms in real life. Lastly, giant metallic structures. So these are just the metals you find in the periodic table. Remember, they have high melting points. That's because they have strong metallic bonds. And a metallic bond is simply the attraction between a positive ion and the delocalized electrons. So if you had to draw the structure of a metal, keep it nice and simple. Just draw a rectangle to represent the metal. Draw some positive ions evenly arranged with a sea of delocalized electrons surrounding them, and that will be sorted. Why are metals or giant metallic structures such good conductors of heat? And that's again due to delocalized electrons, satellite, which are free to move and carry the heat throughout the structure. Why do metals conduct electricity? Again, that's because they have a sea of delocalized electrons which are free to carry the current. Lastly, two other properties, the fact that metals are malleable, which remember means that they can be hammered into shape, and that they are also ductile, which means they can be drawn into a wire. The reason for both of these properties is because the layers of ions can slide over each other. And touching a bit more on this, why do alloys tend to be harder than pure metals? Remember an alloy is a mixture of metals or something like a mixture of metals and a non-metal. So for example, steel is an alloy of iron because it contains iron and carbon. Now, why do alloys tend to be harder than pure metals? That's because the alloys have ions of different sizes, which means the layers can't slide as easily so it's not as easy to distort the layers. So metals now, we're going to start by looking at their properties. So remember metals have high melting and boiling points, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, they are shiny, they are sonorous, which means when you hit it they make a noise, they are malleable and ductile. So what does malleable and ductile mean? Well malleable means that they can be hammered into shape and ductile means they can be drawn into a wire. Another thing to notice is stuff relating to how they bond. So be aware that when they enter into bonding, they tend to lose electrons to become positive ions. They form basic oxides, which we'll come into later, and they partake in ionic bonding. Non-metals now, their properties include the following. They are dull, so they're not shiny. They tend to have low boiling and melting points. There are exceptions to this, which we'll come on to later, but that is the general rule. They are brittle, which means when you hit them, they easily break. They form acidic oxides. They gain electrons in bonding to become negative ions, and they partake in covalent and ionic bonding. So how is an ion formed and what is an ion? So an ion is a charged particle which is formed from either gaining or losing electrons. So clearly, if they lose electrons, they lose negative charge, so therefore they become positive. If they gain electrons, they gain negative charge, so they become negative. I'm going to show you my favourite method of balancing equation, which always works. So if you can't actually see straight away how to balance them, use this method and you'll be able to balance any equation. So start by doing a dotted line and then list the elements present on each side of the equation. And obviously they ought to be the same. So we've got hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium. And then just copy that straight over and line that up nicely. And now we want to do a tally chart to show how many of each element we have. So count the hydrogens on the left-hand side of the equation. So we've got one present in the nitric acid, two present in the calcium hydroxide, so that's three. The number of nitrogens is one. The number of oxygens, well, three on the nitric acid side, and then you've got one inside the brackets, but the two after the brackets means that there's two, so add those up all together and it's five. Now the calciums is just one. Now we need to do the same for the product side of the equation. So how many hydrogens do we have? Well, that's two, which is present in water. Oxygen, you've got three present in calcium nitrate, but remember that small two after the brackets means that's doubled, so that's six, plus one found in water, so that's seven. Nitrogen, you've got two. In calcium you have one and now we need to have a look at our tally charts and see what the issue is so the calcium are fine the nitrogen are not fine 
you've got two on the right hand side, one on the left hand side, so we're going to add a big two in front of nitric acid. Remember when we're balancing equations, all you're allowed to do is add big numbers. And now readjust your tally. So you now have four hydrogens, eight oxygens, two nitrogens. So the nitrogens are happy, the calcium is happy, but the oxygen hydrogens aren't. So I'm going to put a two in front of water to make that four hydrogens. And now adjust the oxygens. So you now have eight oxygens. And look, the whole thing is balanced because you have four hydrogens on both sides, two nitrogens, eight oxygens, and one calcium. So that is indeed balanced. One small definition you must learn, you need to know the definition of one mole of particles of a substance. And that is the Avogadro's constant number of particles, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms of that substance. And secondly, a mass of relative particle mass in grams. Looking at more calculations now, use the formula triangle to help you rearrange. And you can see that mass is therefore given by the relative atomic mass, which is MR, times number of moles. Moles is going to be mass over MR. And that's a good way of rearranging without too much effort. So let's get started and have a look at some examples. So first of all, we're just finding the MR of calcium hydroxide. And that's just a matter of looking at the various masses in the periodic table. It tends to be the top number and adding them all together. So if we have a look, we see calcium is 40. Oxygen is 16. But we have to times it by 2 due to this small 2 here. And then we add hydrogen, which is 1. And again, times it by 2. Pop that into your calculator and you get an MR of 74 grams. Now looking to find the number of moles in 5.4 grams of calcium carbonate. So I like to write out the equation I'm using, it's good practice. Stops you making silly mistakes. So using my formula triangle I see it's mass divided by MR. We've been given the mass in the question which is 5.4. Now we need to work out the MR of calcium carbonate. So using the periodic table, calcium has a mass of 40, carbon is 12, oxygen is 16, and we need to multiply that by 3 due to this 3 here. So that's 5.4 divided by 100 of 0 0.054. Now we're looking to find the empirical formula of a compound which contained 22% carbon, 4.6% hydrogen and 73.4% bromine. I like to lay out these questions always using the table format. So first of all, list your three elements and then draw a table underneath. Mass, MR, moles. And don't forget your formula triangle. Always be aware. So remember, mass is at the top, MR and moles. And then just substitute what you know from the equation from the question. Now notice even though it's given percentages, because it's a ratio, really you can ignore the percentages and pretend that those are the masses, which is why I'm now going to put the mass of carbon as being 22, hydrogen is 4.6 and bromine is 73.4. Now use your periodic table to find their MRs. Carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1 and bromine is 79. And then looking at our formula triangle, we see to calculate the moles, we simply do mass divided by MR. So that's 22 divided by 12 for carbon, which is 1.83 recurring. 4.6 divided by 1 is obviously 4.6. And then 73.4 divided by 79 is 0.929113. And a note here, don't round too early because the numbers are so small you'll introduce rounding errors keep them nice and long in your calculator then we want to divide by the smallest number so just have a scan and obviously 0 0.9 is the smallest number so we're going to divide all of the previous answers by that number 
And this is so that we have a ratio. I wish my iPad would stop deleting stuff. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. So once you've done that, you know that will be one. This comes out of 4.95, which I can happily round to five because that's basically what that number is. And this comes out of 1.98, so that's basically two. So don't be scared to round, only if the numbers are very close. If one of the numbers had come out at 1.5, for example, so for example, 1.5 versus 1, what you'd have to do in that case is double both, so you have a ratio which is 3 to 2. But I don't want to talk about that now, because I want to finish this question. So don't forget to actually provide your empirical formula, which is C2H5Br. And that is your final answer. Sometimes they like to extend the question and tell you in part B that a different compound had a mass of 216 and then based on this empirical formula you've just calculated, work out its molecular formula. This is really straightforward. All you have to do is work out the MR of the empirical formula you've just calculated. So work that out, which would be 2 times 12 plus 5 times 1 plus 79, so that's just a basic MR calculation. Once you've done that, you see that it's 108, and compare it to the compound you've been given, which is 216. So the compound you've been given must therefore have a molecular formula, which is just twice that of the empirical formula. So the actual final answer here is just C4H10Br2. If the MR of your empirical formula had been the same number, which is 216, then your answer would just have been the empirical formula, which is C2H5Br. Let's have a quick chat as to how we would experimentally determine empirical formulae. And we're going to use magnesium oxide in this example. So we will start with magnesium ribbon. We're going to pop it into a crucible. And remember, I can't draw, so apologies in advance. And then we're going to heat it using a Bunsen burner. And what you find is that magnesium ribbon reacts with oxygen in the air, forming magnesium oxide. Obviously, in order to work out the empirical formula of magnesium oxide, we need to know the mass of the magnesium and we need to know the mass of the oxygen. So the way in which we're going to do that is by using measuring balances. So we're going to measure the mass of the crucible, this little ceramic pot here. So measure mass of crucible before heating. We're going to measure the mass of the crucible with the magnesium. And then lastly, measure the mass of the crucible with the magnesium oxide. And through a variety of calculations, we'll be able to determine both the mass of the magnesium and the mass of the oxygen. And we're going to do a practice calculation just to show that this works. So slightly more complicated example in question two, but it st still remains similar, the methods you need to use. So magnesium ribbon, 10 centimetres long, is placed in a crucible and its mass recorded. The crucible is heated strongly and air is allowed to enter. After cooling, the crucible and its lid and contents are reweighed. So let's make sure we're clear of what's happened here. Because we've got magnesium and it's being burnt in air, we know that we're going to be producing magnesium oxide. And indeed, that's the formula we're after. But we need these results given in blue to help us work that out. So we have the mass of the crucible and the lid, which is 30.911 grams. We have the mass of crucible plus lid plus magnesium, which is 31.037 grams. And lastly, the same, but with magnesium oxide, which is 31.106 grams. So what we need is to find the masses of magnesium and oxygen. It's nice and easy to find the mass of magnesium. You simply need to take these numbers away from each other. So do 31.037 grams, take away 30.911 grams, and you'll get a magnesium mass, which is 0.126 grams. Next up, we want the mass of oxygen. Let's number them one, two, and three. So two and three are exactly the same, apart from we also have oxygen 
in number three, which is why you just want to take two away from three in order to work out the mass of oxygen. So do 31.106 take away 31.037 to get a mass of oxygen, which is 0 0.069. And now we're ready to do our empirical formula calculation. So as always, start with your elements. We've got magnesium and oxygen. Here's our table as before. So our masses we've just worked out for magnesium is 0 0.126 grams. Oxygen is 0 0.069 grams using your periodic table to look up their atomic mass. You can see that for magnesium, that's 24.31. For oxygen, that's 16.00. To work out the number of moles, we do mass divided by MR, and you get a number of moles for magnesium of 5.2 times 10 to the minus three. For oxygen, that is 4.3 times 10 to the minus three. This is slightly more difficult, but look for the smallest number. It is this one. So we divide both numbers by that smallest number. To get obviously a one on the right hand side and 1.2 on the left hand side. Now, because this is A level IB, they're not necessarily gonna be nice, easy numbers like they were at GCSE. So we need to make both of these whole numbers. And the way you do that is you have a look and you see the point, the 1.2 is the problem. So how would you make that a whole number? Well, you need to multiply it by five to get rid of that two. So multiply, so multiply both sides by five to get six versus five. And that is your final answer. So the formula is MG6O5. Now I'm going to show you a water crystallization type of mole calculation. It's really similar to empirical formulae, so don't let it freak you out just because it looks more difficult. So 35.75 grams of sodium carbonate combined with water are heated strongly and 13.25 gram remain after heating, calculates X. So obviously after you've heated it, it will now become anhydrous, which means you've driven off the water. So lay it out like the table again, Na2CO3, but instead of listing the elements, you're just going to have the various components of the question. So it's just going to be sodium carbonate on the left, water on the right, and then mass, MR, and moles as usual. So we know that 13.25 grams of the sodium carbonate remain after heating, which is why this is the number here. I'm going to have to do a small calculation to work out the amount of water that was lost. So that's 35.75 minus 13.25 to get 22.5. The MR used the periodic table, so we'll see sodium is 23 times it by 2 because of that small 2, plus carbon's 12, plus 3 lots of oxygen, which is 16, to get an MR of 106. And I know off by heart that the MR of water is 18, and you can check that in the periodic table if you don't believe me. To work out the number of moles now, mass divided by MR is giving us 0 0.125. This is 1.25. And then divide by the smallest number, which is clearly 0 0.125. So that will obviously be 1. This is 10. Therefore, x equals 10. And that's it. It's very similar to the empirical formulae question. Now we need to look at reacting mass and gas volume questions. So 3.3 grams of hydrochloric acid react with sodium carbonate to calculate the mass and volume of carbon dioxide collected. Now, I do imagine that in your question paper, they'll give you the balanced symbol equation, which is the starting point of this calculation. However, in another part of the exam paper, they could easily expect you to write out your own salt equations and to balance them, which is why I'm going to do all of that right now. So hydrochloric acid, reacts with sodium carbonate to produce a salt which is sodium chloride plus water plus carbon dioxide make sure it's balanced i know i need a two there and a two here and now we need to use the table format in order to help us answer the rest of the question so mass mr and moles and don't forget to use your formula little triangle down here which is mass MR moles. And this is how I always set myself up to make sure I'm going to get the 
question right. So what have we been given in the question? Well, we know 3.3 grams of hydrochloric acid reacted, and we know we need the volume and mass of carbon dioxide, which is why my X goes here. Now, the MR, use the periodic table. Now, make sure you're just adding up the hydrogen and the chlorine. You're not including the two in this. So it's just 1 plus 35.5 equals 36.5 grams. The MR of carbon dioxide is going to be 12 plus 2 lots of 16, which is 44. Using the formula triangle, we see that moles is mass divided by MR. So we do 3.3 divided by 36.5. To give us 0 0.09041.09 and now remember what we can do here is carry that number across to be the number of moles of carbon dioxide do check the big numbers up here now there's two lots of hydrochloric acid compared with only one lot of carbon dioxide which is why in order to carry over the moles we have to actually divide 0 0.09041 by 2 and that becomes 0 0.045205. And now we're ready to work out the unknown mass of carbon dioxide, which is mass equals MR times moles. We've already calculated the MR, which is 44. Moles is 0 And that is two grams to three significant figures. Why is it so noisy in London everywhere? Now to make sure we're answering the second part of the question, which is to do with gas volumes, make sure you know that one mole of any gas occupies 24 decimeters cubed. So we know the number of moles of carbon dioxide, we've already calculated that, which is 0 0.045205. Therefore, to work out the volume, simply times that by 24, it becomes 1.08 decimeters cubed. So that's the answer to the second part of the question. Do notice that it, they could have asked you it in terms of centimeters cubed, and in order to convert decimeters cubed to centimeters cubed, you just have to times by 1,000. So just times that number by 1,000, and therefore your answer here is 1,080 centimetres cubed to 3 sig fig. 3.2 grams of copper reacted with 0 0.4 moles of nitric acid. Which reagent is in excess? Don't worry too much about this. We're going to use the same method as always, which is the table format. So we're going to write mass, MR, and moles down the left-hand side. And remember our triangle, which I'll put here, which is mass at the top number of moles and MR. So we know that 3.2 grams of copper reacted. And weirdly, we're going to put X here because that is important and I'll say why soon. So first of all, what is the MR of copper? Using your periodic table, you see it's 63.5. So using your formula triangle, how do you work out the number of moles? You do mass divided by MR, so that's 3.2 divided by 63.5 to get 0 0.05 mole. And then have a look at the big numbers. We've got an invisible one here. We have a four here, and I've already taught you. You just need to pull that number across, but instead times it by four, so you get 0 0.2 moles. So now we compare. We have a look, and we have a look at what we were given in the question. Well, we were told we had 0 0.4 moles of nitric acid, but we only need 0 0.2. So clearly nitric acid is in excess. Now we're looking at percentage yields. So for example, in a reaction, 11.2 grams of copper sulfate was obtained when theoretically 12.5 should have been obtained. Calculate the percentage yield. So you just need to use this equation here, which is percentage yield equals actual yield over theoretical yield times 100. So the actual yield here was 11.2. The theoretical one was 12.5. Multiply it by 100, and you get a value which is 89.6%. Now they can be more difficult than this, so I'm going to show you that example now. So let me talk you through a slightly more complicated version. So a student reacted 2.4 grams of copper oxide with sulfuric acid. She made 1.8 grams of copper sulfate. 
calculate the percentage yield. So as always, we need to start with a balanced symbol equation. So that will be copper oxide plus sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, forms copper sulfate, CuSO4 plus water. And then step back and double check that it is balanced, and it is. And we're going to use my favorite table as well, obviously, because I never do a more calculation without it. So let's start with what we know. We know that we have 2.4 grams of copper oxide and we have made 1.8. So that is the actual yield. And we need to find out the, the theoretical yield, which is why I'm gonna put an X here. So now it's just a matter of working out the MR of copper oxide. So do 63.5 plus 16. So use your periodic table for that to work out that it's MR is 79.5. To work out the number of moles, simply do the mass divided by the MR, so that's 2.4 divided by 79.5 to give a value which is 0 0.0302 moles. Now we need to look at the balanced symbol equation and have a look if there are any big numbers that aren't, so we can easily just carry that number across to be the number of moles of copper sulphate. Now work out the MR of copper sulphate, so you want to do 63.5 plus 32 plus 4 times 16. So that gives us an MR which is 159.5 and then we work out X by doing 159.5 times by 0 0.0302 to get 4.8169 grams and now we can just substitute that into our percentage yield equation because that is the theoretical yield. So percentage yield is given by actual yield over theoretical times by 100 because we're looking for a percent. So actual was 1.8. Theoretical was 4.8169 times that by 100 and we get a value which is 37%. So when we look at solids, liquids and gases, be prepared to draw their particle diagrams. Notice that solids have particles which are in very fixed arrangements and that's because the particles vibrate around in fixed positions, they have little kinetic energy and there are strong forces between them. Moving to liquids, you see that the particles are slightly more widely spaced apart, they're not touching quite as much so they have intermediate forces between them and they vibrate more and they don't have fixed positions. Gases now, so you need your particles to be further apart. This is because they have large amounts of kinetic energy. Obviously, they're not held in fixed position, and there are weak forces between the particles. And here's your summary now. Let's start naming the correct conversions between all these various states of matter. So remember, if you're going from a solid to a liquid, that is melting, like a solid ice block turns into water, melting. If you go the other way and the water turns into ice, clearly that will be freezing. If you have a liquid and it turns into a gas, that will be boiling or evaporating. And then when you have a gas and it turns back into a liquid, that is condensation. So that's what happens when you have a shower and you see it getting all misted up on the windows. Condensation is occurring here. Touching slightly more on evaporation, so how does the evaporation of a puddle or, or any liquid happen really? So what you find is that the particles have differing kinetic energy. Now those particles with the most amount of energy will evaporate first and they will leave the surface of the liquid. And what will happen is it will mean that the remaining particles have lower average kinetic energy. Do notice that in a closed container, condensation and evaporation will be occurring simultaneously, which means at the same time. Looking at solutions now, so be aware of the solution words you need to know and their definitions. So we're going to use coffee being dissolved in hot water as our example so that you can actually understand the words I'm saying. So we're trying to make a nice cup of coffee and we're going to start by looking at what a solute is. So a solute is a solid which dissolves in a solvent. So in the case of our coffee example, the solute is the coffee grounds. The solvent is the liquid in which the solute dissolves, so in our example that would be the hot water. The solution is the mixture of the solvent and solute. 
So that would be the nice cup of coffee that we make. And then a saturated solution is one where you can't dissolve any more solute into the solvent. So it's at its maximum capacity effectively. If we need to define solubility, just be aware, and this is a slightly trickier definition to remember, that it's the mass of solute needed to dissolve in 100 grams of a solvent in order to form a saturated solution. Looking at some fundamentals which underpin chemistry, we need to look at an atom element mixture and compound. So an atom is the smallest particle of a substance that can exist. There are probably more accurate definitions for this and that will involve high level physics, but for all intents and purposes, for your chemistry GCSE, this is what you need to know. An element contains only one type of atom and it cannot be split by any, any chemical means. So basically, if you're given a list of substances and you're asked which is the element, cross-reference the list to the periodic table and you'll soon be able to see if what you have is an element or not. If it's not in the periodic table, it is not an element. Compounds now, well that's when you have two or more elements which are chemically combined and what that means is you cannot separate them back into their constituent elements and a good analogy for this is when you make a cake, so you add flour, egg, sugar and effectively when you bake it, it turns into a cake and that's the equivalent of a compound because there's no way you can separate those cake particles back up into eggs, flour, sugar, that's not going to happen and that's due to the chemical reaction that's take, taken place. A mixture is different to this, a mixture contains, as you would imagine, two or more elements, this time not chemically combined, so theoretically you should be able to separate your mixture into its constituent components. And then now I'm just going to bring up an example table showing elements, compounds and mixtures, and you should have a go at potentially separating them out yourself, and make sure you can tell the difference. When we look at a pure substance, this is a substance which contains only one type of material. So that could be, for example, one element, so carbon, or it could be one compound, such as carbon dioxide. But the point is, there's nothing else in there contaminating it. If you think you have a pure substance and you want to look at its boiling point, be aware that a pure substance will have a fixed boiling point and should not boil over a range of temperatures. If it boils over a range of temperatures, as crude oil would, it's a mixture, it is not a pure substance. We now need to touch on separation techniques, so I'm going to give you all the different examples and how you would use each of them. So first of all, filtration. You are going to use this to separate an insoluble solute from a solvent. An example here could be sand and water. The reason filtration works so well is you pull the mixture through the filter funnel containing filter paper and what you'll find is the sand stays in the funnel, the water flows through into the beaker below, so you've separated your insoluble solute from the solvent and be prepared to label all the apparatus involved and be able to draw simple diagrams. Getting slightly more complicated now, we now have a soluble solute that needs separating from a solvent. This could be something like salt being separated from water. So clearly filtration won't work because the salt will go straight through into the beaker below, which is why we need to use evaporation. So you have a tripod with gauze on the top, an evaporating basin containing the salt solution. You boil using a Bunsen burner. The excess water boils off and you're left behind with salt in the evaporating basin. Next up, we're separating immiscible liquids. So these are liquids which do not mix. A good example here is oil and water. And you will find that oil, and you can see this at petrol stations if for some reason it's rained and then petrol's ended up in the puddle. You can see the petrol floating on top of the water and that's what happens with oil too. So in this case, you can just put it into a funnel. You can open a tap and the water will drain out first, close the tap and you'll leave the oil behind in the funnel. Now liquids of different boiling points, for example, ethanol and water. Clearly evaporation and filtration won't work here. And this is where you use simple distillation. And simple di distillation relies on the fact that liquids have different boiling points. Because what happens is you use a Bunsen burner to boil the mixture of liquids and the liquid with the lower boiling point will evaporate first. So that would be the ethanol with a boiling point of 78 degrees Celsius, leaving behind the water below. And if you have a real mixture of liquids with lots of different boiling points, such as crude oil, this is where you'll use fractional distillation, which actually allows you to separate out many different liquids of different boiling points. Our last separation technique is chromatography. Remember this is used to separate liquids of different solubilities, so that could be food colouring, 
dyes, inks for example, be prepared to describe how you set up a, a chromatogram. Remember you have filter paper which you draw a reference line on in pencil. You put a dot, the dots of ink along the pencil line and then you dip the paper into water. As the water soaks up it draws the dyes up the paper and you can determine several things from that. So first we'll notice that you draw the reference line in pencil. Why? Because you don't want the pencil to spread and go flowing up the paper too because that will disrupt your chromatogram. Notice that the ink which travels the furthest has the highest solubility, which kind of makes sense. And be prepared to use the formula, which is the RF formula. And that's the formula whereby the distance travelled by the component is divided by the distance travelled by the solvent. So how can we make water fit for drinking? And um, we use the word potable to describe this water. And there are three major steps. Step one is sedimentation, which enables you to remove small insoluble particles, so things like sand. Step two is filtration, which you should have done at school, which allows you to remove the dissolved substances. And step three, which is one of the most important steps, which makes it suitable for drinking, is chlorination, which, as the name suggests, means adding chlorine. And remember, we add chlorine to swimming pools. Why? To kill microorganisms that might make us ill. And this method is mostly used when we're purifying waste or groundwater. When we're looking at purifying seawater, so salt water, we tend to use distillation, which we met as a separation technique earlier because remember, we heat that water, the water evaporates, leaving behind the salt. meaning that it has now been purified. So watch that bit of the video again if you need to know more about distillation. And one separate point is notice that water used in the analysis of products must not contain any dissolved salts. So that needs to be extremely pure. Indicators. So you need to learn various colours of indicator. So obviously the most common one is universal indicator. That shows the pH scale from 0 to 14. Remember 0 to 6 is acidic. 8 to 14 is alkali. So 7 is neutral. Universal indicator in a neutral solution is green. In an alkaline solution is purple. And in an acidic solution, if it's a strong acid, will be red. And that will be about pH 1. Other indicators you may come across have less of a range of colours, such as methyl orange. Now, methyl orange is red in acid. It is yellow in alkali. Phenolphthalein, which is a very difficult word to spell, is colourless in acid, and it is a beautiful pink colour in alkali. And lastly, litmus is red in acid and blue in alkali. Topic three, chemical changes, zooming in on acids. So we need lots of definitions here. So first of all, what is an acid? Well, it's a substance which donates hydrogen ions. And that's all you have to write in terms of a definition. In terms of alkalis, well, these donate hydroxide ions. Remember that the pH scale allows us to see how acidic or alkaline a substance is. It ranges from 0 to 14. Obviously, 7 sits in the middle, and using a very simple colour chart, we know that acids have a pH of less than 7, alkalis have a pH of more than 7, and a pH of 7 means that you have a neutral substance. And notice that on the pH scale, a strong acid is red, a neutral substance is green, and a strong alkali tends to be purple or dark blue. So linking together our definitions, so an acid donates hydrogen ions, you find that a strong acid will have a very high concentration of hydrogen ions.
whereas a strong alkali, so pH 14, for example, as you would expect, would have a very high concentration of hydroxide ions. Getting slightly more complicated now, do notice that as the hydrogen ion concentration increases by a factor of 10, the pH of the solution decreases by 1. So taking an example, we know that a low pH, e.g. pH 1, 2 and 3, are very strong acids. When we get higher, 5 and 6, you have weaker acids. And if you look at what we're talking about with our comments, so as hydrogen ion concentration increases by a factor of 10, the pH of solution decreases by 1. So if you compare pH 5 and 6, well, pH 5 is obviously 1 less than 6, and so it has a 10 times as big hydrogen ion concentration when compared with pH 6. So let's write that out. And that's true for any change in pH. So pH 1 will have 10 times as many hydrogen ions when compared with pH 2. Looking at more key definitions, so a strong acid, well we know acids donate hydrogen ions they can donate hydrogen ions to a lesser or greater extent. A strong acid will donate lots of hydrogen ions and we say that it fully dissociates into ions. A weak acid therefore partially, so only dissociates or only gives up a few hydrogen ions. Touching on the words dilute and concentrated. Remember in everyday life when you're drinking orange squash, for example, you could have a dilute orange squash, which means it doesn't taste very much of orange. If you have a concentrated orange squash, it tastes lots of orange. And that's due to how many orange squash particles are present. So dilute means you have very few particles. Concentrated means that you have large amounts of particles. So let's make it more scientific and we're going to say dilute means a small amount of solute and that's really the posh word for particles in this case it means the solid which dissolves whereas a concentrated solution has a large amount of solute per unit volume in a neutralization reaction you find that you have an acid with an alkali. We know that the acid donates hydrogen ions. We know that the alkali donates hydroxide ions. So if we're reacting an acid and an alkali, we know we make a salt plus water. And if we were to write a summary equation, we have the hydrogen ion reacting with the hydroxide ion forming water. So as with all things in chemistry, it makes a huge amount of sense if you look at it from the right way. We're now going to cover the salts topic and when we're talking about salts, we need to know a lot about acids and bases because that's where the salt originates from. So do remember your definition of an acid, which is that it is a H plus donor. A base is a H plus acceptor and it also tends to be a hydroxide donor. And examples of bases include metal carbonates, metal hydroxides and metal oxides. Just remember the difference between a base and an alkali, they're very similar. An alkali is simply a soluble base. So remember, all alkalis are bases, but not all bases are alkalis. So some background about salts. So effectively, a salt is formed when the hydrogen of an acid is replaced with either metal or ammonium. For example, say you had hydrochloric acid, you acted it with potassium oxide, then you would end up with potassium chloride, which is the salt. Taking sulfuric acid now, pretend we reacted it with calcium carbonate, you'd end up with calcium sulfate, which is the salt. So now let's look at some common acids and the salts that they produce. Now in terms of the reactivity of acids, remember that only metals above hydrogen in the reactivity series will react with acids. 
So things like copper, silver and gold, which lie beneath hydrogen in the reactivity series, will not react. Elements at the very top of the reactivity series, such as potassium, sodium and lithium, they will react extremely explosively and I don't recommend that anyone tries this because it would be extremely dangerous. So now let's take you through the salt equations. So we're going to start with looking at the general equation when you have metal plus an acid, that forms salt plus hydrogen. And I'm gonna show you some examples. If you have metal oxide plus an acid, then you make salt and water. Metal hydroxide this time, it's the same as metal oxide in that you produce a salt and water. And lastly, metal carbonates, when you react those with acids, you produce a salt plus water, and then because of the carbonate, you produce carbon dioxide. So do make sure that whatever is on the product side started off on the reactant side. Don't start creating carbon dioxide on the right-hand side when there was no carbon on the left-hand side. And similarly, don't have hydrogen and water forming on the right-hand side. Only one of them forms, so make sure you know which one it is. solubility rules, learning which salts are soluble and which are insoluble. The reason why I'm smiling is because this is disgusting. It's awful, I really struggle to remember them. Now there is a huge table which you can try and learn off by heart, but I much prefer to learn the rules and if you assume that most things are soluble and learn the exceptions, that's a good way to go. So let's start by stating that all nitrates are soluble. All potassium, ammonium and sodium compounds are soluble. All sulfates are soluble, there are three exceptions, and that is lead 2, calcium and barium sulfate. All chlorides are soluble, except from lead 2 chloride and silver chloride. Now we switch and we look at things which are insoluble, so we say that all carbonates are insoluble. The exceptions will clearly be the sodium, potassium and ammonium compounds, which makes sense because I've already told you that the sodium, ammonium and potassium compounds are soluble. And similarly, all hydroxides are insoluble, the exception being sodium, potassium and ammonium compounds. So let's just do a quick test on that. So I'm just going to say a couple of salts and you need to decide if they're insoluble or soluble. So starting with lead nitrate, that is soluble because it contains nitrates. Next up, potassium carbonate, that is also soluble because it contains potassium. Now we're looking at magnesium sulfate. That is soluble because remember all sulfates are soluble with a few exceptions. What about barium sulfate? Well, that was one of the exceptions you had to learn. So that is insoluble. And now calcium carbonate. That is insoluble because it is carbonate and it is not sodium, potassium or ammonium. So I hope you can see you can work it out using these rules. So let's look at the different methods for making these salts and we're gonna start by looking at soluble salts, but do notice these are ones which do not contain ammonium, potassium or sodium. So what you can do here is you can use metal oxide, a metal hydroxide or metal carbonate. You react it with the acid and you form your soluble salt. You can also use metals plus acid, so it doesn't need to be combined with an oxide, hydroxide or carbonate. But do notice that you need a metal which isn't mega reactive, because clearly if you're reacting it with an acid, you could end up with a dangerous explosion if you're using group one metals. So be sensible and use something like magnesium. Now the method you're gonna actually use is crystallization. Your summary for this is that you're gonna react, for example, your metal hydroxide with your acid. You're going to filter in order to remove any undissolved solid. Then you're going to evaporate, so you're going to place that solution in an evaporating basin over a Bunsen burner with gauze and a tripod and you're going to get rid of excess water, so you'll evaporate some of the water. Then you're going to allow the mixture to cool and eventually you want to let it dry out in a warm place, so on a warm windowsill in a drying oven for example or on paper. Looking at making soluble salts now, ones which do contain sodium, potassium or ammonia, you're going to use a slightly different method. Now the reason why you can't use the crystallization method I just described because the sodium, potassium, ammonium are extremely soluble. So if you added them to acid which contains water, they would react with both the acid and the water and they would continuously dissolve away, meaning that there'd be nothing to filter and therefore nothing to evaporate. So that's why crystallization doesn't work in this case. So in this situation you have to use the titration method. So titration is the method you use when making ammonium, sodium or potassium salt. The reason you use the titration is because you need to know the exact volumes of acid and alkali you need to add in order to make the salt. So for example, we set up our burette and it contains the acid, 
We place the alkali and the conical flask together with an indicator. And then as you know, with a titration, you keep adding the contents of the burette to the conical flask, swirling all the time until you get that indicator to change. And when it does that, you know you have the exact volume of acid and alkali. Then you repeat the entire experiment, this time without the indicator, because obviously that would disrupt your salt. And because you know the exact volumes of both the acid and the alkali, you can create the exact amount of salt, there won't be any excess to dissolve away, and therefore you'll have a perfect salt. Once you've done that, your method is the same as we've just described with crystallisation, because you've got your solution, you now need to evaporate off the excess water, you need to allow it to cool, and then you're going to leave it to dry in a warm place again. So it's very similar to the crystallisation method, you, you still use it, but unfortunately you have to use the titration method initially in order to obtain the correct volumes. And now we're going to look at how we carry out a titration. Lastly, we're making insoluble salts. In this case, you're going to react two soluble salts and obviously make sure you pick the right salts that will create the insoluble salt you're after. So if you're after barium sulfate as your insoluble salt, clearly the first thing you're reacting has to contain barium, so something like barium nitrate. The second thing has to contain sulfate, so it could, for example, be potassium sulfate. You react them together in order to form barium sulfate and leftover will be potassium nitrate. So do be sensible, make sure that whatever's going in will make your insoluble salt, which is why it's important that you know your solubility rules so you know which salts are soluble and which ones are insoluble. By the way, this is a disgusting topic. Um, everyone thinks so, so don't worry if you're finding it quite tricky. So when you're making insoluble salts, this is actually the most straightforward method you'll use. You're gonna react, so you're gonna mix those two soluble salts together. You're gonna filter to remove any excess solid. You're going to wash, again, to remove that extra solid. And lastly, leave to dry and do state where you're drying it. Don't just say dry, so say in a warm place or on filter paper or in an oven. And this method we describe as being the precipitation method. I'm just going to describe a, an example of the precipitation method to try and show you exactly what is going on. So in this example, we're going to take silver nitrate and sodium chloride. Notice that they are both soluble because they contain nitrate and they contain sodium. So what happens when you place them in solution is all the ions separate, so you're left with Ag+, which is silver, chloride ions, which is Cl-, nitrate ions, which are NO3-, and sodium, which is Na+. Now, in order to make that insoluble salt, remember what we want to happen is for the silver and the chloride to be attracted, and indeed they are. They are strongly attracted, forming silver chloride, which is an insoluble salt. Now the remaining ions, the nitrate and the sodium, are very weakly attracted, so they remain in solution and they're the soluble salt formed. Oh, we can move away from that disgusting topic now and just look at generic tests. So the test for hydrogen, don't say it's the squeaky pop test, you won't get a mark for that. You need to say that you hold a lighted splint over the gas and if hydrogen is present there should be a squeaky pop. Carbon dioxide, remember, turns lime water cloudy. And in electrolysis, remember, you have your giant ionic structure. It needs to be molten or in solution. Why? To allow ions to be free to move so they can carry current. That is essential. So if you have solid sodium chloride and you attach the electrodes to it, you're not going to be able to conduct electricity through that sodium chloride. We've just discussed this in chemical structures because the ions aren't free to move. Putting in solution means that the ions are free to move so we can carry a current. So those two electrons, electrodes dip into the substance. Now remember the electrodes are made out of an inert substance and that means an unreactive one which makes sense. You don't want to get involved in the reaction. So they can be made out of things like platinum or graphite as these are unreactive. In terms of naming things properly, you've got to remember what an anion and a cation is. So cations are positive ions, anions are negative ions. So remember, opposites attract. So anions, which are negative, will be attracted to the anode, which is positive. And the cation, which is positive, will be attracted to the cathode, which is the negative electrode. So do try and remember that. And I always use PANC to help me remember. Positive anode, negative cathode. Anodes attract anions, cathodes attract cations. So the ode ending is the electrode and the ion is the ion. In terms of remembering what forms where, 
you need to remember a few rules. So if you if you have aqueous solution, that makes it more complicated because as well as, let's take sodium chloride for example, so as well as the sodium and the chloride in the solution, you've got hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, and remember only one of those ions can move to each electrode. So let's take the negative electrode first of all, which is the cathode. That is obviously going to attract a positive ion because opposites attract. Now in order to work out which ion it attracts, remember it is the least reactive element that discharges at the negative electrode. So in the case of sodium chloride with hydrogen and hydroxide, that will be hydrogen, so H plus ions will discharge. And when you're writing these equations, remember you've got H plus, you're trying to make it neutral, which is why you have to add E minus, you have to add electrons to it, and it will form H2 because remember hydrogen is diatomic. Because you've added electrons, remember this is reduction. So don't forget oil rig. Oil rig is a way of remembering the difference between oxidation and reduction. Oil, so oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. So in the case of hydrogen, you've got a gain of electrons, so reduction. Now looking at what discharges at the positive electrode, make sure you remember that halogens discharge before anything else. We have a halogen in solution here, a halide ion. It's chlorine, so chlorine will discharge. So Cl minus will have to turn into Cl2. The easiest way to see what will happen is because it's minus and you need it to become neutral, you need to remove the negativity, which is why you need to remove E minus. Because you've lost electrons, you've therefore carried out oxidation. And you must practice lots of these questions because this is really quite tricky. Do notice that both hydrogen and chlorine are both diatomic molecules, so you'll be making H2 and Cl2. And remember the other elements which are also diatomic is nitrogen, chlorine, fluorine, bromine and iodine, and oxygen. Now do remember this as a list because in case it comes up and you've got to balance equations, you've got to remember that they're diatomic. And my friend who's also a teacher, she told me a way to remember this, which is horses need oats for clear brown eyes. So hydrogen is horses, need is nitrogen, oats is oxygen, four is fluorine, clear is chlorine, brown is bromine, and eyes, it's a bit strange because obviously it's not eyes, it's about eyes, but iodine. Going back to our aqueous sodium chloride example, so I've already told you that hydrogen discharges, chlorine discharges, so left over in solution you have sodium hydroxide. And this is actually a very important industrial process because all three of these products are very useful. Why? Because chlorine is obviously used as a disinfectant. It helps to kill bacteria in drinking water and swimming pools, for example. Hydrogen can be used as a fuel. It's also used to harden vegetable oils to make margarine. And sodium hydroxide is used for making bleach and for making paper. Let's take a look at a few more key electrolysis examples, starting with molten lead bromide. So the ions involved, obviously lead, which is a metal ion, so it's positive. Bromine, it's in group 7. Remember, non-metals form negative ions, so to work out its charge, you do 8 take away 7 to get 1. So its charge is Br-. And how are we going to make our neutral substance? So we're going to be producing lead. We've got a 2 plus charge on the left-hand side, so we need to add electrons. Because we've added electrons, according to oil rig, reduction is gain of electrons. So that's why that process is reduction. And obviously, remember that the positive ion, so the Pb2+, plus, will be attracted to the negative electrode, which is why this takes place at the cathode. Taking Br- minus now. Now remember that it's going to be producing bromine, which is a diatomic molecule, which is why we have Br2. That means we need to balance the Br- by writing a 2 here. So we have 2 Br- on the left-hand side. We need to get rid of that negativity. So what we're going to do is take away 2E-. An alternative way to write this, which your teachers may have taught you, is to simply add the 2- on the right-hand side. It means the same. These both mean exactly the same and they're both perfectly acceptable. Just do whichever one makes you happiest. I like this one because it makes more sense in my head. Now, because electrons have been lost, as you can see, we're going to call that oxidation. And where does it take place? Well, the negative Br- is obviously going to be attracted to the positive 
electrode, which is why that takes place at the anode. In our next example, we have copper chloride solution. This is slightly more difficult because we have more ions in solution. So what do we have? Well, we have copper, we have chlorine, and then the solution is aqueous, which means we have water, which we're going to write as two ions, which is H plus and OH minus. Now we know that both ions can't discharge, only one ion can discharge, so you need to look at your positive ion, your copper and your hydrogen, and decide which one will effectively win. Now you're looking for the least reactive element here, so as you look at your reactivity series, you can see that that would be copper, so that one is going to win. Looking at the negative ions now, remember that if a halogen is present, it will always win. And obviously, chlorine is in group 7. It is a halogen. So without doubt, that one is winning. So I know that that is going to discharge. Chlorine is again diatomic, which is why I've written Cl2. And now it's a matter of filling in the electrons. So how do we get Cu2 plus to being neutral? Well, we need to add negativity. So we're going to add two electrons. Because we've added electrons, reduction has taken place. And remember, of course, the Cu2 plus will have been attracted to the negative cathode in the first place. Cl minus now, we need to make that balance, which is why we need a 2 here. We're getting rid of the negativity, so that's why I'm minusing 2e minus. Because I've lost electrons, oxidation has taken place. And in the original reaction, the Cl minus will have been attracted to the positive anode. Sodium sulfate solution now. So sodium, that will be Na plus. Sulfate, SO42 minus. However, we have a solution, which means it's aqueous, it contains water, hence the presence of these two ions, hydrogen and hydroxide. So we need to decide which element wins. Now, with the positive ion, obviously it's the least reactive element, that will be hydrogen, so I'm going to circle that. With the SO42 minus and hydroxide, when there's no halogen present, such as in this case, we have no group 7 elements, we know that water will be produced, and that comes from hydroxide, so I'm circling this. Let's write our ionic equations. Hydrogen is diatomic, so we need two H pluses. I need to add two electrons in order to neutralise it. We have done reduction, and that has taken place at the negative electrode, because it attracts the positive hydrogen ion. Now looking at the hydroxide ion, this is far more complicated and probably worth learning off by heart. You're going to produce water, oxygen, and you need to balance it to make sure you have enough of everything. Now we've got far too many oxygens on the right hand side. Personally, I would just learn this off by heart that you need four hydroxide ions, which means you need two waters. And in order to balance your electrons, you've got to put four E minus here. Oxidation has taken place because the hydroxide ions have lost electrons and this has taken place at the anode because that is the positively charged electrode which attracts the negative hydroxide. Next up, water is acidified with sulfuric acid. So water, that means the ions present are H plus OH minus. Sulfuric acid, its formula is H2SO4 which means it's made up of H plus and SO4 2 minus. So we've got H plus again. So really we can get rid of one of them because they're the same. In terms of the other negative ion, we have SO4 2 minus. Remember, we have no halogens, so water will discharge preferentially, which is why I'm circling the hydroxide ion as that goes on and produces water. So very similar equation to last time. We've got hydrogen discharging, so that's the balanced ionic equation, reduction has occurred because the hydrogen ions have gained electrons. This has taken place at the cathode. Now to discharge our OH minus. We know it's producing water. I remember that it produces two lots of water, so we need four OH minus plus O2 plus four E minus. That is obviously an oxidation reaction and it takes place at the anode. Let's look at some industrial processes that actually involve the process of electrolysis. So first up, how is copper purified by the electrolysis of copper sulfate solution? So you have impure copper, you really want to purify it to give it more useful properties.
So the first thing you need to do is make sure you have copper sulfate solution because that means you'll have Cu2 plus in solution and you'll have SO42 minus in solution. Now notice that in this situation, appalling drawing coming up, but hopefully it shows you in essence what's going on. You've got to have electrodes made from copper when you're purifying it. And in terms of the anode, that will be made out of impure copper. And what you find is that these copper atoms lose electrons to become copper ions. So here we can see oxidation taking place and that occurs at the anode. And then these copper ions migrate to the negative cathode, as you would imagine, because they're oppositely charged. And they gain electrons to become copper atoms again, which we call reduction. And therefore, at your cathode, you're going to have pure copper. Notice that the impurities collect as a sludge at the bottom of the electrolysis chamber. Do reactivity series. So you need to learn the order of metals in the reactivity series. And that is potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium. Then we mention carbon because although it isn't a metal, it's good to use it as a reference point. This is followed by zinc and then iron. Hydrogen comes next, not a metal, but still a good reference point. And lastly, our unreactive metals go copper, silver, and then lastly, the most unreactive is gold. And that explains why you find silver and gold native in the Earth's crust. You can literally just find it in streams and rivers, and that's because it's incredibly unreactive. Even though aluminium looks fairly reactive because it appears quite high in the reactivity series, due to its oxide layer, it means it's less reactive than you would imagine. So we have an unknown metal and we don't know how reactive it is, so there are several things we can do to try and determine its position in the reactivity series. So first of all we would try to react it with cold water. Now only very reactive metals such as those found in group 1, so we're looking at potassium, sodium and lithium for example, will react with cold water and they'll form metal hydroxide plus hydrogen which we've already met. If they don't react with cold water you can then try steam and this will produce a metal oxide and hydrogen. And then lastly, if it doesn't react with steam, you can try acid, and that will produce a salt plus hydrogen. And you obviously wouldn't try reacting group one metals with acids because they are far too reactive. Do notice that when you look at the reactivity series, only elements which are more reactive than hydrogen will react with acids, and that's because acids contain hydrogen, such as hydrochloric acid, it's HCl, sulfuric acid H2SO4, nitric acid HNO3, so in order to react with acids they must be more reactive than hydrogen. Let's take a few examples then of metals reacting with water. Now remember only very reactive metals will react with cold water, so looking at group 1 metals mostly. So let's take potassium as an example. We're adding it to cold water and remember it produces potassium hydroxide plus hydrogen. Let's write our balanced symbol equation. So we know that we need to work out the formula of potassium hydroxide. It's made up of these two ions. Because they both have a charge of one only, it means you can just pop them together to produce the formula potassium hydroxide. So writing out the balanced symbol equation. Remember that hydrogen is diatomic. Check to see if it needs to be balanced. Yes, there's too many hydrogens on the right hand side. So I'm going to put a 2 here, which means I now need two oxygens on the right-hand side, so a 2 here, and then a 2 in front of the potassium. Let's double-check. Two potassiums on the left and right side, four hydrogens on the left, four hydrogens on the right, two oxygens on the left, two oxygens on the right, and that is correct. If you're struggling with balancing equations, please don't worry, lots of people struggle with it. This video is an all-in-one, which is why I'm not going to spend um, hours showing you how to balance equations, but I've got a great video, which I'll try and link below that you can go and check out to help you.
Let's take another example, this time looking at magnesium, which tends to only really react with steam. So we've got magnesium, we're reacting with steam, which is obviously water, but instead of making a hydroxide, we're going to be producing an oxide, which is magnesium oxide plus hydrogen again. Double check to see if it's balanced. It is balanced, so luckily there's nothing for you to do here. Lastly, looking at a less reactive metal, one which reacts with acid, we're going to take zinc. I'm going to react it with sulfuric acid, H2SO4. It's going to produce zinc sulfate plus hydrogen. Double check to see if it's balanced. Yes, it is. Let's look at displacement reactions now. As the name suggests, it's when one element takes the place of another. And we tend to find it happens with metals. So when a more reactive metal displaces a less reactive metal, and we'll look at some proper examples to help make this make sense. So let's take the reaction of zinc with copper sulfate solution as our example. So you do need to look at both the metals, zinc and copper, and decide which is less reactive. So copper is far less reactive. Zinc is more reactive, which means it can effectively boot the copper out of the way and steal its sulfate. And as you can see, the metals effectively change places. So copper comes out by itself and zinc takes its place within the sulfate. Let's take a look at the ionic equations to actually understand what's going on here. So if we take our zinc, which you know is a solid, we separate our copper sulfate into its various ions. The reason we can do that is because it's an aqueous solution. The ions are actually free to move. So it means you have Cu2 plus plus SO4 2 minus. They're both aqueous producing copper solid, which we can't split up because it's a solid, but we can split up the zinc solution for the same reason as before. At this point, you delete the spectator ions, and these are the ions which remain exactly the same on both sides of the equation. You can see that that is the sulfate ion, so we delete them, and then we rewrite the equations, but this time with just a single element in the equation. So I'm going to kink zinc together, and copper will become a new equation down below. And then as we've seen with electrolysis, we are now in a position where we are happy to add electrons here and show what has happened. So how did I get from zinc solid to Zn2 plus? Well, I had to take away negativity for zinc to become positive, which is why I'm taking away 2e minus. And then for copper 2 plus to become copper solid, we need to add electrons so what's taken place? Well, we've taken away electrons in the first case, which is why this is oxidation. And in the equation below, we've added electrons. So according to oil rig, we have had reduction taking place. This particular part is extremely high level. So honestly, as long as you've got everything else nailed, you'll be absolutely fine. Don't worry too much if this is just a step too far, because you want to make sure you're concentrating properly on all your subjects and obviously not just chemistry. Now looking more at the extraction of metals, so I already told you that very unreactive metals such as gold and silver are obtained straight from the earth's crust. So we know how we obtain very unreactive metals, we find them just in the earth's crust, but how do we obtain moderately reactive metals? So things like copper, iron, zinc, and this time we have to extract them from ores. And these are rocks which contain a large proportion of the metal in question. For example, iron ore is known as hematite, and that contains iron oxide. Aluminium ore is known as bauxite, and that is aluminium oxide. Now, your method used to extract these elements and make sure that they're by themselves because you don't want them combined with oxygen will depend very much on the reactivity series. Iron is less reactive than carbon, which means that carbon can be used to purify it using a displacement method. So to write this as a summary, you're gonna use reduction with carbon method Notice the word reduction. We've learnt that reduction means gain of 
electrons, it has a second definition, which means loss of oxygen. So what we're saying here, by saying reduction with carbon, is that carbon is going to cause that iron oxide to lose its oxygen. And we use the blast furnace in order to do this. You don't need to know too much detail with this. But what you do is you heat the carbon, which you've added to the furnace in the form of coke. It reacts with oxygen in the air, eventually forming carbon monoxide, CO. And that CO reacts with iron oxide. And if I show you the summary equation, this will make more sense. So it forms iron by itself, which is after all what you're after, plus carbon dioxide. And that's balanced. Now, if you were to look at elements more reactive than carbon, things like aluminium, for example, magnesium, there is absolutely no point in trying to react that aluminium oxide with carbon. Carbon is not reactive enough, so it will not steal the oxygen. No displacement will take place. So instead, we've got to use a different and far more expensive process, which is electrolysis. Obviously, we've already met electrolysis, but this is when you pass electricity through the molten metal compound to cause it to break down and produce the pure metal. So looking at the electrolysis of aluminium oxide, for example, slightly different arrangement. You find the negative electrode sits around the bottom. That's the cathode. You have your electrodes dipping in, which are made out of graphite because that's an unreactive material, which is essential. And obviously, the positive electrode is known as the anode. So what happens here is the molten aluminium collects at the cathode, so be prepared to write the equation. Because it's gained electrons, reduction has taken place. At the anode, you've got oxygen discharging. Because it's not an aqueous solution, it's just going to be a direct O2 minus to O2. Make sure you've balanced it. We've lost electrons, so that's oxidation. So electrolysis is a far more complicated, far more expensive method, and that's due to the high electricity costs. Notice the elements which are less reactive than carbon. Ele electrolysis would certainly still work as a method for obtaining the metal, but we would choose not to do it because it's far too expensive. So when you can, you'll use reduction of carbon. When the metal is too reactive, you'd have to use electrolysis, but that's why making aluminium, for example, is so expensive. So looking more closely at these definitions, because I've kind of talked about them, but I just want to summarise them properly. According to oil rig, oxidation is loss. That's what oil stands for, and we're talking about electrons here. Reduction is gain, again, of electrons. The alternative definition for both, oxidation is the name would suggest. If I asked you before I'd ever taught you anything about electrolysis, what oxidation meant, you might say that it would have been the gain of oxygen, and indeed you'd be correct. So these are the alternative definitions. Reduction being the opposite of that would be the loss of oxygen. And notice where reduction and oxidation occur together at the same time, we call this a redox reaction. So the re standing for reduction, ox standing for oxidation. Increasingly, we're using biological methods to extract metals, and something you might have heard of is bioleaching. So bacteria grown on ground which contains very little of the metal in question, such as copper. The bacteria produce something called a leachate, which contains the metal ions in question. And then you can obtain that, those metals in that leachate through a process of either displacement using scrap metal that's basically been disposed of, or electrolysis. And these are both ways in which you can purify that leachate to get the metal you're after. Another method you could use is phytomining.
And in this case, you're not looking at bacteria, you're using plants which are grown on ground containing a small amount of the metal. They obviously absorb the metal in their roots because plants are always absorbing metal ions, we know this. From biology, they need magnesium to help them make chlorophyll in their leaves in photosynthesis. So once the plants are grown, the plants are burnt to form ash. And at this point, the metal can be extracted, usually using sulfuric acid. So what's the advantage of using these methods? Well, firstly, you can obtain metal from very low grade ores. you find that there's less damage to the landscape because you don't need huge mines. And fewer pollutants produced. However, the disadvantage here is that you've got a very slow process and small amounts are obtained in comparison to ores that have a huge amount of the metal in question within them. Zooming in in more detail, let's look at bioleaching, the advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages is that you need low temperatures, which means it's cheap, but a disadvantage is that toxic substances can be produced which are harmful to the environment. In terms of phytomining, so using plants, the advantages here are that you are able to extract metals from contaminated soils. But the disadvantages are that it's an expensive process and obviously it very much depends on the healthy growth of the plants. If they don't grow, then they won't absorb the metal ions and you won't get any metal. Hot topic at the moment, which is all to do with recycling. And in the case of chemistry, we're really looking at the recycling of metals. So what are the advantages? And you can really use your common sense here. We're not looking at hardcore chemistry. Obviously, you'll conserve natural resources. There's less of a need to mine ores. So those ores remain intact in the Earth's crust. And as a result, because obviously mining causes huge disruption to the landscape, dust and noise pollution, so we'll have less damage to landscape. Less dust and noise pollution. In terms of the actual industrial processes involved, there's often burning, which results in sulfur dioxide, obviously leading to acid rain. So we'll have less sulfur dioxide pollution. And lastly, less waste metals in landfill. However, with most things, there are disadvantages. So what are the disadvantages of recycling? Firstly, cost and energy used to collect, transport and sort metals. And often you find that these costs and energy requirements are greater than if you were to just extract the metals in the normal way. LCA now, life cycle assessment. Now, what this is all about really is assessing the product and looking at the raw materials required to manufacture it, how it's packaged and how it's used and disposed of. So we're increasingly looking at the environmental impact of the various products that we manufacture. So what is the LCA? Well, it's an assessment of a product. So we look at the raw materials needed to make it, how it's packaged, how it's used 
and finally how it's disposed of because obviously if it's non-biodegradable then it's just going to sit in landfill for thousands of years so ideally we want it to be biodegradable and it's used to determine the environmental impact so we can actually decide whether its manufacture is worthwhile and it enables you to compare similar products made from different materials. Now we're looking at equilibria, I'm very excited, I'm getting near the end of this and uh, it's been going really well, so I'm happy. So with the term exothermic, let's define it. First of all, it means the release of heat energy. And remember that more energy was needed to make the bonds in the product than was needed to break the bonds in the reactants. So looking at endothermic reactions, you'll see the opposite. So heat energy in this case is taken in and more energy is required to break the bonds in the reactants than was needed to make the bonds in the products. Other terms we need to know, activation energy, this is simply the minimum amount of energy required for a reaction to occur. How do catalysts work? Well, we know from biology that they speed up the rate of reaction without being used up. In terms of how they work, it's because they provide an alternative reaction pathway with a lower activation energy, and I'll show you some energy profiles so you can actually see that lowered activation energy. So chemical equilibria now, we are looking at reversible reactions here, so be aware of this special arrow. This is your reversible arrow and it tells you that the reaction is happening in both the forward and backwards direction. And what that really means is the reactants react to produce the products, as we're used to seeing, but then the products will fall apart effectively and produce the reactants again. So these aren't ideal conditions when we're talking about industrial processes because it basically means you make very little of the product that you're after. And we use the word yield to describe the amount of product produced. So let's start by looking at what a dynamic equilibrium means. Now, first of all, the word dynamic means that the reactions are ongoing, which means that the forward and reverse reactions are occurring at the same time. Because it's equilibrium, it means they're occurring at the same rate and that there is no overall change in the concentrations of reactants and products. And this is only true if it occurs within a closed system, and a closed system is simply one where nothing is allowed to escape. So no gases can leave and no more reactants get added. It remains a sealed vessel. So looking closer at dynamic equilibria, let's look at the effect of a catalyst. Now you must notice that a catalyst simply increases the rate of reaction. We know this, I've just said it, it does it by providing an alternative reaction pathway with lower activation energy. Note it does not alter the position of equilibrium, so it doesn't increase the yield of the products. It keeps the position of equilibria in the same place, it just increases both the forward and reverse reactions equally. A summary now of what happens when we choose to alter reaction conditions. So remember we can alter the position of equilibria if we change both the temperature and pressure. As I've already said, the catalyst has no effect. Remember, when a reaction is exothermic, the whole reaction gets hotter, and when it is endothermic, the whole reaction gets cooler. So, if we start by increasing the temperature, we know we need to oppose the change, so we're going to favour the reaction which results in a decrease in temperature, which is why increasing the temperature favours the endothermic reaction. And that means that the position of equilibrium will shift to favour that endothermic reaction. So if you have an equation and the delta H says that it is positive, we know that the forward reaction is therefore endothermic. So increasing the temperature will favour the forward reaction. Decreasing the temperature will favour the exothermic reaction and the position of equilibrium will shift to favour that. And if this is sounding complicated, don't worry because we're going to use the Harbour process as an example to help us understand it. Looking at pressure now, if you increase the pressure, what happens is equilibrium position will shift to favour a decrease in pressure. So it will shift to the side with a few moles of gas and you count the number of moles by looking at the big numbers in front of the formulae. Decreasing the pressure will favour the side with increased number of moles of gas, so position of equilibrium will again shift. So the Harbour process, this is the manufacture of ammonia and it involves the use of nitrogen and hydrogen. Delta H is 
negative, which means the forward reaction, the reaction which produces ammonia, is exothermic. So in order to increase the yield of ammonia, it makes sense, therefore, that we decrease the temperature. Why? Because the forward reaction is exothermic, so the position of equilibrium will shift to the right, and therefore more ammonia will be made. However, the problem with low temperatures is it's all to do with collision theory, means that the particles have very little kinetic energy. So although when they collide, a reaction takes place, the likelihood of them colliding is now very low because of the low temperatures, which is why we actually have to increase the temperature to 450 degrees Celsius, and we therefore call these conditions compromised. Looking at the pressure now, if we count the number of moles of gas, by looking at the balanced symbol equation, you can see that there are four moles of gas on the left-hand side and two moles of gas on the right-hand side. So in order to increase the yield of ammonia, we need to increase the pressure because remember, increased pressure will favour the side with fewer moles of gas. Therefore, the position of equilibrium will shift to the right, meaning that more ammonia is made. Now again, this is a compromised condition because although the high pressure will favour increased yields, Unfortunately, high pressures are expensive and they are dangerous because the vessel, reaction vessel needs reinforcing and therefore we used a compromised pressure of 200 atmospheres. We do add an iron catalyst when we're talking about ammonia. The addition of the iron catalyst increases both the forward and reverse rates of reaction, but it has no effect on the position of equilibria and therefore it has no effect on the yield of ammonia. Let's look at another example now. So I'm going to bring up an equation which is showing NO2, reversible arrow, and N2O4. And do notice their colours. NO2 is brown and N2O4 is colourless. And look at the delta H sign. It is an exothermic reaction. So let's see what happens when we increase the temperature. So what happens when we increase the temperature is the endothermic reaction will be favoured, which means the reverse reaction will be favoured. So the position of equilibrium shifts to the left. You therefore make more NO2, and so therefore the colour changes and it becomes brown. Looking at pressure now, and we are going to increase the pressure. So let's compare the number of moles of gas on both sides of the equation. You can see that there are two NO2s and only one N2O4, so increasing the pressure will favour the forward reaction, so the position of equilibrium shifts to the right, and therefore more N2O4 is produced, so the colour will change to colourless. So be prepared to talk about what effect various changes in pressure and temperature will have, and again, notice catalysts have no effect. Looking at protecting iron from rusting, so rusting is when metals flake away and you only use the word rust when you're talking about iron. If you talk about any other metal, you can't call it rust, you have to say it corrodes. So you could say that zinc corrodes, but only iron rusts. So what conditions are needed for rusting to occur? You need water and oxygen for this and salt actually increases the rusting process but is not necessary. What are the different ways in which we can prevent rusting? There are the simplest ways which is just simply painting or using oil and grease to protect the iron and stop it being exposed to water and oxygen or you can become more fancy and use methods such as galvanising. So galvanising is when you use a more reactive metal such as zinc and it reacts before the iron. And so actually what happens is the zinc, zinc ions, and, don and donates electrons. And what that means is the electrons can flow to iron. And therefore if the iron starts to rust and form iron ions, this is hard, why have they got the same name? Those electrons which have been, been donated from zinc can help the iron form its iron atoms again so it doesn't rust away. Try not to worry too much if you're not understanding what I'm saying. Just learn that galvanising is using a more reactive metal to protect iron. When other metals oxidise and react in preference to the iron through the method of galvanising, don't forget we call this sacrificial protection. And because we've just talked about the transfer of electrons, let's remind ourselves of the definitions of oxidation and reduction, so oil rig. Oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. Redox now, and that as the name suggests, is a reaction where reduction and oxidation occur at the same time. A reducing agent is a substance which causes another substance to be reduced, so it forces the other substance to gain electrons, and therefore, by definition, a reducing agent is therefore oxidised. An oxidising agent causes a substance to become oxidised, so it forces the other substance to lose electrons, and therefore, by definition, an oxidising agent 
is reduced. So electroplating, what is it? Well, it's when you coat the surface of a metal. And it's usually done with another type of metal. For example, cheaper jewellery, ones which aren't made entirely from gold or silver, they can be made out of things like copper. But people don't want to wear copper jewellery or jewellery that looks like it's made from copper because it has a different colour. People don't really wear that brownie coloured metal. So what happens is that copper jewellery gets coated in a thin layer of either gold or silver. And so you end up with jewellery which looks like it's made out of gold or silver, but isn't, and for that reason it's much cheaper. Another example is using chromium plating. On motorbikes made out of steel. The reason we do this is because that chromium is harder, more shiny, so it gives it a very appealing finish, and more resistant to corrosion, all of which are great properties for the motorbike to have, but so much cheaper if you plate the vehicle made out of steel rather than have the whole vehicle made out of chromium. So let's look at why steel is harder than iron and you can use this argument which for any question which is like why is the alloy of blah 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 harder than the pure metal. It's always the same argument because steel is an alloy after all. It's made out of iron and carbon. So let's look more closely at this. So here I've drawn a particle diagram of iron, a pure metal. And you can f see here that the atoms have the same size, they're regularly arranged. So if we were to apply a force on the left-hand side, the layers of atoms would slide and the structure breaks apart. Looking at steel now, which we know is made up of a mixture of iron and carbon, these atoms are going to be different sizes. So if I state this first of all, and then we try to apply a force on the left hand side, what you find is that the layers of atoms can't slide as easily, as you can see, due to the distortion. Looking at the uses of iron, and you need to know about the different types of iron in terms of how much carbon they contain. Don't forget that when iron has carbon combined with it, it's now formed an alloy, and that alloy is called steel. So looking at low carbon steel, so that's steel containing less than 0.25% carbon, you find that this steel is very strong, malleable and ductile. Don't forget malleable means it can be hammered into shape, ductile means it can be drawn into a wire. And its use is in car bodies, so that's to make the outside of a car for making bridges and shipbuilding. There are disadvantages with using low carbon steel and that's because it rusts easily and it's very heavy due to its high density. Taking a different type of steel now, which is high carbon steel, so this is any steel containing between 0.6 and 1.2% carbon. Now this is much harder than the low carbon steel we've just mentioned. However, it is brittle, which means it breaks easily. We find that it's used for cutting tools such as knives, for example. And lastly, stainless steel. This is an alloy containing also chromium, nickel, and obviously iron. Iron, this is highly resistant to corrosion or rusting, which means it makes great cutlery. So a lot of your cutlery, your knives and forks and spoons will be made out of stainless steel, and you'll probably see it written on there. It's also used to make saucepans and gardening tools. Why do we go to such effort to obtain aluminium? Well, it's because it's an extremely useful metal. It has really great properties mainly because it has low density, 
So compared with other metals, it's light, but we can't say light in the exam, we say low density, which means it's good for use in making aeroplanes. We've obviously also seen its use in making drinks, cans, etc. It's also a really good conductor of heat, which is why you find a lot of pans are made out of aluminium, which is why wiring can sometimes be made out of aluminium. Let's look at titration calculations now. So 25 centimetres cubed of 2 mole DM minus 3 hydrochloric acid reacted with 30 centimetres cubed of sodium hydroxide. Calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. You need your balanced symbol equation for this, which again, I think they'll give you, but you do need to be able to do this as a separate skill, which is why I'm going to do it now. So the salt made is sodium chloride and water is the byproduct. Double check to see if it needs balancing and it doesn't. And then to be clear, make sure you use this formula triangle now, which is number of moles goes at the top, concentration and volume go at the bottom and therefore titration calculations will be really straightforward for you. So just make sure in your table this time it goes moles, concentration and volume. And then substitute in what you know from the question. So your concentration of hydrochloric acid is 2 moles dm to the minus 2, so that's going to be 2. The volume we've been told is 25. Now, to make sure you don't screw up these questions, make sure you convert that straight into decimeters cubed. So I do that by just writing divide by 1,000, so I know what's put into my calculator. We know the volume of sodium hydroxide is 30, so I'm going to do the same here. Make sure I've divided it by 1,000 in order to um, account for the fact it needs to be in decimeters cubed. And then we're looking for the unknown concentration of sodium hydroxide. So the moles is concentration times volume. I can see that from the formula triangle. So let's work out the number of moles of hydrochloric acid. So 25 divided by 1,000 times 2, which is 0.05. Have a look at any big numbers. There aren't any, so that means I can carry that number straight over. And that becomes the moles of sodium hydroxide. To work out this unknown concentration, we have to do moles divided by volume. We can see that from the formula triangle. So we do 0 0.05 divided by 30 over 1,000. Just pop that all into your calculator as it is. And you get an answer which is 1.6 recurring. So that rounds to 1.67 moles dm to the minus 3 to 3 sig fig. So what is the atom economy of a reaction? Well, first of all, it's a percentage calculation used to show the efficiency of a reaction. And really what we're looking at is how many atoms of the reactants are used to make useful products. Let's look at an equation because equations are always extremely useful. So you're after the MR of the useful product and we want to divide it by the MR of all the reactants and because it's a percentage we're going to then multiply that number by 100. Clearly if all atoms of the reactants are present in the product you find that atom economy is 100% however you do tend to find that it's never 100% because there's always a byproduct. So as we've said, if all atoms of the reactants are present in the product, then we have an atom economy of 100%, but this is never the case due to byproducts. So here's a practice question. What is the atom economy of, and here's our equation below, and this is actually showing the fermentation of glucose. Here's our formula for glucose, C6H12O6 and it forms ethanol, which we use in beer making, and carbon dioxide that we use in bread making. And in this particular question, the useful product here is the ethanol. So let's have a look at our equation. We want the MR of the useful product, so that's going to be the MR of C2H5OH over the MR of all the reactants, so that's C6H12O6. And notice this 2 here, which means we're going to have to multiply that ethanol's MR by 2. And then we need to multiply the whole lot by 100. So let's quickly do the maths. 
So carbon has a mass of 12, there's two of them, plus hydrogen, which has a mass of one, there's five of them, plus oxygen, which is 16, plus one for hydrogen. Then we need to multiply the whole lot by two. And now we'll do the bottom row of working. So 12 times six, plus 12 times one, plus six times 16. Once you pop that into your calculator, you'll get a value which is 51.1% to three significant figures. And that makes sense. The answer obviously should never be over 100. So how do chemists actually decide if they're going to carry out particular industrial processes, if they're actually going to produce a certain substance? So what do chemists need to consider? First of all, they need to consider the reaction pathway. So the reaction's actually involved. That's my cat, by the way. Then they need to consider the percentage yield. They want it to be a relatively high percentage yield. There's not much point in the reactants reacting together to produce very little product. Kitten, shh. And linked with that is obviously going to be atom economy, rate of reaction. And then we need to look at raw materials because that will influence the cost. Energy requirements, so the input of electricity, for example, because that's extremely expensive, as we know from the electrolysis of aluminium oxide. Whether our raw materials are renewable, so if our raw material is crude oil, for example, then we're not going to really like that reaction, because obviously crude oil is non-renewable. And a very good example for this sort of consideration is looking at the manufacture of ethanol. So we need another example of a new reaction pathway chosen due to more favourable factors. And our example here is the manufacture of nitric acid, which we now make using the Oswald process. It's produced from ammonia. With these reaction conditions, temperature is not too high, pressure is fairly low at four atmospheres. It involves a platinum catalyst, which we know will speed up the rate of reaction and it has few byproducts, which is a good thing. We don't want lots of extra substances that have no use being produced. So this is all good. Historically, it used to be made using the Birkeland Ide process, I think I'm pronouncing that wrong, which involved lots of electricity. So we didn't like this way of making nitric acid. So fertilisers, hopefully you've met this in biology. We add these to our soils to help plants grow because they tend to contain lots of nitrates, which plants need for their protein growth. So in general, their definition is that they're compounds which replace mineral ions in soil and promote plant growth. And the elements we tend to be talking about here is nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, which is why a lot of fertilisers are known as NPK fertilisers. So nitrogenous fertilisers, as the name suggests, contain lots of nitrogen. You can't just take nitrogen from the air and put it into a fertiliser, it doesn't work like that. It needs to be made into a salt, and there's various different salts you need to know about. So the first one is ammonium nitrate, NH4NO3. Now this salt is made from ammonia solution and nitric acid, as the name would suggest. So let's take that equation. Here's ammonia, it's aqueous. We add it to nitric acid, HNO3, to produce NH4NO3. How do we get hold of the ammonia? Well, you've met that in the equilibria topic. It comes from the harbour process. The nitric acid comes from the Oswald process. I think I probably spelt that wrong on the other slide. The next nitrogenous fertilizer we need to look at contains the salt ammonium sulfate, which is NH42SO4. Again, as the name suggests, it's made from ammonia and sulfuric acid. The reaction equation for this will therefore be ammonia, which is NH3, plus sulfuric acid, H2SO4, producing the salt, NH42SO4. Let's make sure it's balanced, so we need a 2 in front of the ammonia. And again, the ammonia is made by the harbour process. 
the sulfuric acid comes from the contact process. Remember the electrical symbol for a cell looks like this. And then if you've got two or more cells together, then you have a battery. And the reason we add these to our electrical circuits, so here's my simple circuit containing a light bulb and a cell. Well, it's that cell that provides the push needed to drive the electrons around the circuit, enabling that bulb to light up. So they're incredibly useful and we find them in a whole plethora of things our mobile phones, the remote controls used to operate the TV, these all contain batteries, but we now need to look at the chemistry which underpins them. So first of all, know that our electrical cells and batteries rely upon the differing reactivity of metals. So remember the reactivity series, we have potassium near the top, calcium sits beneath it in the reactivity series, iron, I'm only picking out a few metals here but we know that potassium is very reactive and that copper is very unreactive. And the chemistry we use in order to create these batteries relies upon the difference in the reactivities of metals. And what you actually find that when you actually select your metals you're going to use to create your cell or your battery, you want to be picking two metals that differ hugely in terms of their reactivity because they'll generate far more voltage. An overview now of how a simple cell works. Let's look at what we actually need in order to do this. Well, firstly, you need two metals. And as I've already said, they must differ in terms of their reactivities. And you want to dip these metals in a salt solution and we will look at proper examples and they have to be joined using a wire and we often call this wire a salt bridge which makes sense because bridges do actually join various parts of the country now what actually happens is that the more reactive metal will donate electrons to the less reactive metal And let's write out that point I was making, which is that the greater the difference in the reactivity between the two metals, the higher the voltage produced by the cell. So please note. And notice if you actually connect this simple cell with a complete electrical circuit, so you basically seal it off with wires, you'll actually generate a current. But that's only if you get a complete electrical circuit, not just a simple beaker with your electrodes and your salt bridge. So let's take a proper example. I'm gonna pick copper and zinc. And notice that copper is far less reactive than zinc. In this example, we have copper and zinc, which are used to make two electrodes, and these electrodes are dipped into a salt solution containing copper sulfate, and we know that what actually happens then is that electrons flow through the wire from the zinc to the copper, but we need to look at the actual equations which link this, and I've already pointed out that copper is less reactive than zinc, which is essential. So we're going to have the zinc, and it's solid metal, reacting with the copper sulfate solution, and notice, because zinc is more reactive than copper, you find that a displacement reaction takes place where the zinc effectively steals the sulphate. So actually what you produce on the other side is copper plus zinc sulphate. If we draw our half equations, our ionic equations, to show what is going on, I'm going to split up everything into its various ions. So because copper sulphate is aqueous, I know that we actually have Cu2+, plus plus SO42 minus, I'm allowed to separate the ions because it's an aqueous solution. We're producing copper sol solid, which we're not allowed to touch because it's a solid. And then again, we've got various ions on the other side where we split up the zinc sulfate. Sit back and have a look and see what is the same on both sides of the equation. Well, that's the sulfate ion, and we call this a spectator ion, so we're allowed to just cross that out and ignore it at this point. Then to form our half equations, we simply take both elements and form two equations out of them. 
So that means we get zinc producing zinc ions and we get copper ions becoming copper solid. And then we need to balance them by adding electrons in appropriate places. So let's do the copper first of all. We've got it being two plus. We want to stop it being positive. How do we do that? By adding negativity. So we're going to add electrons in this case. I'm adding two of them to balance that two plus. With your zinc, we're trying to form positivity. So how do we do that? By taking away electrons and we need to take away two electrons. Then we need to touch on a couple of definitions we met in the electrolysis part of the specification. Remember oxidation is loss of electrons. Here we can see that electrons are being lost, which is why this step is oxidation. Here the copper ions are gaining electrons, which is why reduction has taken place in the second equation. So if they ask you which species has been reduced, you would write it's the Cu2+. If they ask you which species has been oxidized, you say it's the Zn, and be very specific here. And I've tried to draw you a simple diagram just to show you what's going on. So as I've said, the copper electrode and the zinc electrode are found side by side. They're dipped into the salt solution, which contains copper sulfate. And as I've said here, electrons flow from the wire, from the zinc to the copper. So they flow in this direction. And the electrons flow, make sure you're aware of this, electrons flow from the more reactive metal to the less reactive metal. And in this way, in case they ask you as an exam question, it means that the more reactive metal acts as the negative terminal of the cell. So if we go back to drawing our little cell, this is the negative terminal, that's the positive one. So you find that the more reactive metal, the one that's donating electrons, acts as the negative terminal. And I'll write that out for you too, so you've got it as a note. Hydrogen fuel cells, the reason why we're so interested in this, obviously, is because we are running out of fossil fuels Crude oil is diminishing. We need to find new, cleaner ways of powering our homes and our vehicles, which is why we're so interested in hydrogen fuel cells. Notice that in terms of hydrogen's use, you can take the gas hydrogen and burn it in order to release energy in car engines in much the same way that petrol and diesel have always been burnt. Or hydrogen can be used in fuel cells to power vehicles. And that's actually what this video really is gonna be about, what's going on inside the fuel cell. So we need to get down to some pretty hardcore chemistry here. Don't worry too much if you're not understanding everything, as long as you've got the various advantages and disadvantages of using hydrogen as a fuel, which I will go into later in this video. For me, that's the main part. This bit's pretty high level. However, it's on the syllabus, so I'm going to talk about it now. So how does a fuel cell work? Well, first of all, hydrogen gas is supplied as a fuel to the negative electrode. It passes through the electrode, which is made out of graphite. Why? Because graphite is very unreactive. And reacts with hydroxide ions Form water and in this step it releases the all-important electrons. So if we look at it from an equation point of view, what have I just written? Well I say that the hydrogen reacts with hydroxide ions, so there's my diatomic hydrogen reacting with my hydroxide ions. We know it's forming water, so there's my water and we know it releases electrons and then it's just a matter of balancing it all. So we're going to need a 2 in front of our hydrogen here a four in front of our hydroxide ions. And lastly, make sure your electrons are balanced on the right-hand side, so we need four E minus here. In step two, we have oxygen gas, which is also supplied. So in the first step, hydrogen gas was supplied, but this time we're supplying oxygen. And this time it's going to go to the positive electrode. So, so far we've mentioned two gases and two electrodes. 
it reacts to form hydroxide ions, which is good because that's what we need it to do because the hydroxide ions have featured heavily in the equation above. And it accepts electrons. And we know where those electrons have come from. They've come from the step before where the hydrogen released them. So if we convert what we've just written into words, we have oxygen gas reacting with water to form hydroxide ions. Let's balance this. So we need a two in front of water. We need a four in front of our hydroxide ions. We need to balance our electrons, so we're adding four electrons here. In terms of forming a complete equation, which summarizes the whole process that takes place inside a hydrogen fuel cell, we effectively need to add these two equations together. So I'm simply going to add the two equations together. I'm not going to simplify here. I'm just going to literally add together the left-hand sides of the equations. And let's have a look, see if we have anything that's a spectator that appears exactly the same on both sides of the equation. And yeah, we do. We've got hydroxide ions, the four OH minus. They both exist on both sides of the equation. And the same with the electrons. So we can cross those out straight away and then just rewrite what we're left over with. Now we've got two H2 on the left-hand side, four on the right-hand side. So we can cross out the two on the left-hand side and change this for two or two. And then that's our summary equation, finally. So hydrogen plus oxygen forms two waters. I'm going to reinstate my state symbols. And so if they ask you for the equation which summarizes the process taking place inside the hydrogen fuel cell, this is the bad boy you want to give. And you can either learn that off by heart or you can go through all the steps up here where we've actually worked out why that is the answer. And notice here that the only byproduct is water which is a really great thing. We don't have issues with carbon monoxide. We don't have any sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, which go off and form acid rain. This is an extremely clean byproduct, which is why in this day and age, we are so into hydrogen fuel cells. And this links nicely with the next bit of the video where we're gonna describe the advantages and disadvantages of using hydrogen fuel. So our first advantage here is no pollutants are produced. And you could write quite a lot here. So you could write no SO2, no NO2, so no issues with acid rain, no carbon monoxide, so no issues with it being toxic and poisonous. Do notice though that some processes involved do actually result in the release of carbon dioxide. So it's not a totally 100% foolproof way because obviously carbon dioxide can contribute to global warming. Also notice that there are a range of different sizes of fuel cells, so they have lots of different uses. And lastly, you don't need to electrically recharge them. There are some disadvantages. Although I've said no pollutants are produced, you do find that the hydrogen needed is sometimes produced for the cell by non-renewable resources. So things which require other fuels, which sounds ridiculous, but will release carbon dioxide, possibly contributing to global warming. But I'll try and write that nice and simply for you here. Hydrogen is highly flammable, which is great from a fuel use point of view, but it does make it pretty dangerous. And lastly, because it's a gas, it's incredibly difficult to store and it needs large tankers to store. Right, I hope you found my video helpful, guys. These are so difficult to make but I know you guys really like to just sit and watch the whole thing in one, so please give me a like like this video if you found it helpful it is a good incentive for me to continue my work and don't forget to sub um i'll be back soon with another video bye